If you're at least 35 years old, you probably remember Nike's Bo Knows campaign, which featured football and baseball star Bo Jackson. Bo Knows Baseball. Bo Knows Football. Well, like Bo, Nike's also known a few things over the years. With its incredibly popular advertising campaigns, its instantly recognizable smooth symbol, and its aspirational vibe, Nike has known how to create one of the most iconic brands ever. As a company, Nike knows how to make money, and lots of it, and knows how to help its shareholders make money too. It's a high quality corporation with a pristine balance sheet, a 19 year history of raising its dividend, and a double A minus credit rating, and analysts are bullish on Nike's prospects. I'm high on Nike too, and that's why I recently added it to the public growth and income portfolio that I manage. Hi everybody, Mike Nadell here for the Dividends and Income Channel. Before I talk more about the worldwide leader in sports apparel, please do us a favor to help us grow our channel, okay? Hit the thumbs up at the bottom of the video, subscribe to our channel, and ring the bell so you get notifications of new videos as we publish them. Okay, now let's talk about Nike's history, its business model, and why it might appeal to those who have a long-term investing strategy. In 1964, University of Oregon graduate Phil Knight teamed with his former track coach, Bill Bowerman, to form a company called Blue Ribbon Sports. Always looking for ways to give his athletes an edge, Bowerman also was interested in shoe design. Their first mass-produced shoe, the Tiger Cortez, was a joint project between Blue Ribbon and Tiger, a Japanese company. Eventually, the companies had disagreements that led to a breakup, and in 1971, Blue Ribbon rebranded itself as Nike, after the Greek goddess of victory. Also in 1971, Portland State student Carolyn Davidson came up with the swoosh design, and Nike paid her all of $35 for it. Knight supposedly wasn't all that high on the symbol at first, but he did come around to like it. And in 1983, he gifted Davidson 500 shares of Nike stock. After splits and dividends, that would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Inspired by the waffle iron his wife used, Barman invented the sole pattern for what would become known as the Waffle Trainers in 1974. In 1979, Nike introduced its patented Air Technology, an innovation that uses pressurized air in a durable, flexible membrane to provide lightweight cushioning. Air has remained central to the Nike shoe brand right up to today, although numerous improvements have been made over the years. The company also went on to become a leader in athletic clothing and sporting goods. As famous as Nike is for its shoes and clothing, it's probably at least as well known for its athlete endorsers and advertising campaigns. Tennis player Ilya Nastasi was the first athlete to sign an endorsement deal with Nike in 1972. But the big get for Nike was Michael Jordan in 1984. It seems like a no-brainer today, but many considered it risky for a company to give an NBA rookie a five-year, multi-million dollar contract and his own shoe line. Future superstar endorsers would include LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, Lance Armstrong, Mia Hamm, Kobe Bryant, Serena Williams, Maria Sharapova, Derek Jeter, Kevin Durant, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Rory McIlroy. Michael Jordan's Gotta Be The Shoes campaign and Bo Jackson's Bo Nose ads were immensely popular moneymakers for the company. So was the iconic Just Do It slogan that debuted in 1988 with an ad featuring 80-year-old Walter Stack running across the Golden Gate Bridge. During the 1990s, Nike was criticized for operating sweatshops in Asia with horrible working conditions and low pay. The company made numerous changes to improve conditions, though some still say Nike hasn't done enough. In 1997, Nike spun off the Jordan brand into its own entity, albeit one still under the Nike umbrella. The brand was represented by the well-known Jumpman logo, a silhouette of a young Michael dunking a basketball. In 2003, Nike bought its struggling rival, Converse, and helped lead the brand's resurgence. In 2012, Nike became the official supplier to the NFL. Three years later, it secured the same rights with the NBA. Nike hasn't shied away from controversy over the years. In 2018, the company signed Colin Kaepernick for an ad campaign centered around the former star quarterback getting blackballed by the NFL for taking a knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality. Some predicted that the Kaepernick ad would hurt Nike shareholders, but the stock actually has gained 88% since the campaign debuted, compared to 65% for the S&P 500 index. Last year, Nike's popularity and the continued appeal of Jordan, who now owns the NBA Charlotte Hornets, was illustrated by a winning bid of nearly $1.5 million for the first pair of Air Jordans. Today, as a business, Nike has lapped the competition. In 2020, it had 37% more sales than Adidas, Reebok, Asics, Puma, and Under Armour combined. The company has a $234 billion market cap and it's one of the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. On December 20th, Nike reported earnings for the second quarter of 2022. Revenue, earnings, and margins all topped consensus analyst estimates. The 8% growth in profit 
and 46% gross margin really stood out. Nike Direct Sales, the direct-to-consumer segment that has been gaining steam over the last several years, rose 9%. The only real negative in the report was that revenue from China fell 20% due to supply chain issues, COVID-related work stoppages, and political conflicts. Morningstar analyst David Swartz nonetheless said, We still believe Nike has a great opportunity for growth there and in other emerging markets. The firm experienced double-digit annual sales growth in six of the past seven years in greater China, and fueled by high government investment in athletics, should do so again after fiscal 2022. Moreover, with worldwide distribution and huge e-commerce that totaled about $9.3 billion in fiscal 2021, Nike should benefit as more people in China, Latin America, and other developing regions move into the middle class and gain broadband access. There aren't many higher quality companies out there than Nike. Morningstar says their wide moat gives them a competitive economic advantage and says management allocates capital well. They get a double A minus credit rating from Standard & Poor's. Value Line gives Nike its top scores for financial strength and relative safety. And Simply Safe Dividends gives them a near perfect grade for the reliability of the dividend. And while we're on the subject of dividends, Nike has an enviable record in that department, having grown its dividend for 19 consecutive years. The company increased its dividend by 11% late last year, and because Nike is a tremendous free cash flow generator and its payout ratio is low, I'm confident the raises will keep coming. Still, Nike's dividend is lower than 1%, and even though I think there's room even in dividend growth investing portfolios for low yielders like that, I certainly understand why some income investors might not. I look at Nike's dividend mostly as a bonus, above and beyond the market-crushing total return that the company has produced for investors over the years. Now let's talk for a second about Nike's valuation, about how buyable the stock is. Analysts monitored by tip ranks are very high on Nike. 18 of 21 call it a buy, with an average 12-month target price that represents 29% upside. Argus analyst John Stazak is among the biggest Nike bulls, as he increased his target price to $190 after the earnings call. That's a forecast of a 31% gain over the next year, which he justifies by saying, we expect Nike to continue to dominate the athletic apparel and footwear markets. Although Morningstar believes Nike is an outstanding company, its analysts think the stock is about 10% overvalued at a forward PE ratio of 31. The recent market pullback has largely affected growth stocks and has chopped about 17% off Nike's return. But I do admit that if I were gonna invest big money now, I still might choose something trading at a better value. But with my growth and income portfolio, I make small buys every month, the way many other investors do. When I bought Nike on January 31st, it became the portfolio's 18th position. The portfolio, which I launched in June 2020, was worth about $4,500 at the end of January. Long-term investors have a variety of goals. In the case of the growth and income portfolio, my goal is to eventually help pay for college for my two and a half year old grand twins, Jack and Logan. Here the boys are wearing their favorite Air Jordans. Their daddy says that Jack especially loves the shoes so much he won't wear anything else. So there you have it, another happy Nike customer for life. For more information about the growth and income portfolio, see the link in the description. Once on our dividends and income website, become a subscriber and you'll be notified whenever I write an article about my transactions. For those who really love dividends and passive income, I also manage the income builder portfolio. And there's a link in the description for that too. All right, guys, that's all for today. Again, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of our content. Take it easy, everybody. Back at you soon.